Good afternoon, everyone. I want to start by telling you how I got uh, hooked on brain science. Um, this was about 30 years ago. I was a graduate student in the building next door here. I was working on uh, bacteria. And uh, bacteria are notoriously quiet creatures. But uh, <laughs> when I left the lab and walked down the hall past the lab of uh, David Anderson, I would uh, hear sounds like this coming out of the doorway. And what we're looking at here, what we're listening to, are the sounds of a visual neuron responding to flashes of light. And every click that you hear is an action potential, a small electric pulse that the neuron fires, by which it communicates with other nerve cells in the same circuit. And then I'd walk further down the hall, and Mark Konishi was studying the uh, auditory system of birds, and his neurons were making much the same sounds, same action potentials. And the neurons that control your muscles also fire action potentials. They sound much the same way if you listen to them in a loudspeaker. So the brain is able to take these incredibly diverse kinds of world events, the sounds and smells and sights, movement, thinking, dreaming, sweating, take all these world events and translates them into the common currency of action potentials, spikes in neurons. And that's a really remarkable step of abstraction. It's remarkable, especially for a, a biological organ that's made of flesh and blood, as we found out from Alan this morning. Um, and with that step of abstraction, the brain can now apply a generic kind of machinery to connect these very disparate world events, to make some causal connections that ultimately help the organism survive. And that's what we call computation. That's why we think about the brain as computing, because it translates events into this common language and then operates on these action potentials. Now, the brain's machinery for doing that are circuits of nerve cells. And the, the program by which it computes something, the rules of computation, are embedded in the synapses by which these nerve cells are connected. Now, scientists in our field hope that someday soon we'll be able to understand these circuits in the same level of detail and accuracy as we understand electronic circuits. We hope that we'll be able to draw diagrams of which neurons connect to which other neurons, add some information about the properties of the individual nerve cells and the connections, and from that predict and explain what the circuit computes. Now, my goal today is to have you walk out of here and be able to explain two computations in a little part of the brain, and that little part is the retina. The retina is a little bit of brain that got pushed into the back of the eyeball. The rest of the eye is there to project an image onto the retina. If you take a little section of retina, like that rectangle, and inspect it, you find that it's this beautifully layered circuit of nerve cells. In this picture, the, the red bits and the yellow bits are the cell bodies of neurons, and the blue parts are where they connect to each other, the synapses. At the top layer are the photoreceptor cells. These are the familiar rods and cones that convert a light into a neural signal. And at the bottom layer are the output neurons of the retina. They're called ganglion cells. Each of these neurons has a fiber coming out of it that together form the optic nerve and send these little electrical pulses to the brain. In between the input and output layers is a lot of sophisticated circuitry about which I'll have more to say later. For now, I want to give you an interesting statistic about your retina. Uh, you have about 100 million photoreceptors in each eye, but only a million fibers coming out of it. And so the retina must somehow compress the image from the 100 million pixels down into a million output fibers. And we know now that in the process of doing that, the retina actually throws away about 95% of the raw image that uh, enters your eye. And only 5% of the information gets sent on. Now, the retina doesn't choose those 5% randomly, uh, but instead does something very intelligent. It throws away the information that the brain already knows for some reason or other, information that can be predicted from other information the brain already has, and it sends on only the parts of the image that are novel in some way and unpredictable. And how that works, the computations that allow the retina to do that, is what I want to talk about. 
So consider an image that might have fallen on your retina a short time ago. And uh, let's uh, zoom in in particular. Uh, and uh, uh, on the scale where this uh, little circle is about the size of one ganglion cell. Now, if I tell you that the region all around the circle is gray, uh, what would be your best guess for the color inside the circle? Also gray, right? And that's correct, and it's true most of the time. Why does this work? It's because the visual world is made up of objects, and objects have some spatial extent, and within an object, the color doesn't change very much. So most of the time, the color at one point is like the color at nearby other points. Now, occasionally, of course, uh, that expectation is violated, like here, and that, that uh, a difference from expectation should be signaled to the brain. Now, the retina does something very clever here. It avoids signaling to the brain the expectation, namely those cases where a spot is just like the surrounding spots, and it signals only the cases when the center spot is novel. How does it do that? A typical ganglion cell measures the local light intensity, subtracts from that the intensity in a surrounding region, and sends to the brain only the difference between those two numbers. So in the left case, the output of the ganglion cell will be zero, because it subtracts something from itself, whereas in the right-hand case, the ganglion cell will fire a burst of spikes because the center part is different from the surround. Now, this trick is called predictive coding. It's something that's uh, well familiar to electrical engineers, but nature invented it 100 million years ago. This kind of processing really affects your visual perception. Um, let me give you an example. Um, is there anyone here who thinks that the two tiles that I've marked with dots here have the same color? OK, you should come and see me later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> most of us feel that uh, the tile on the left is dark and the tile on the right is, uh, is lighter. But in fact, they are the same color. But uh, the one on the left is surrounded by bright uh, tiles, and that difference is what uh, gets sent to the brain, and therefore we have the sense that it is darker than the one on the right. Uh, there's a funny episode that illustrates for me the strength of this effect. I recently published this picture in a, in a major textbook. Uh, no point in telling you the title, but it's a book about the principles of neural science. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And, and when we received the very last author proof, the graphics editor had quietly moved the right-hand dot over by one tile <laughs> <laughs> on the idea that I had made a crass mistake uh, in, in labeling the tiles, and it wasn't even worth checking back with me on it. Um, anyway, so it's a very strong effect that results uh, in part, at least, in large part, by what happens in your retina. Well, what actually happens in your retina? So let's get down to neural circuits, which is what we're trying to understand. A retinal ganglion cell gets excited by a bipolar cell, and a bipolar cell gets excited by the photoreceptor above it. So this little circuit, feed-forward circuit, measures the local intensity in the receptor above the ganglion cell. But in addition, ganglion cells get inhibited by amacrine cells. And amacrine cells are connected to bipolar cells further away, out in the periphery. And so that circuit measures the intensity in the surrounding spots. And you can see that the ganglion cell will respond to the difference between the two because it gets excited by the center and inhibited by the surround. So in the common situation where center and surround have the same color, the ganglion cell remains silent because excitation inhibition cancel. But in the situation where the center is brighter, the ganglion cell will fire a strong burst of spikes. So here's an example of how the retina computes a prediction. From the uh, surrounding spots, the, it computes an expectation for the center and subtracts that from the expected image. Now, what about uh, prediction in time? It turns out that works equally well. Here's an example of a movie that might have fallen on your retina if you would wander around campus uh, before the show or later today. Let's zoom in again on a little spot in the movie that's about the size of a ganglion cell. So if you were told that the spot was the dark gray, three movie frames in a row, what's your expectation for the next frame? Dark gray, exactly. Again, because uh, visual objects have some permanence, they don't move infinitely fast, and so most of the time, what's at this point is just like what it was before, 
except occasionally it's not. Yeah? Now, in a case like this, the retina should not signal to the brain that the spot is dark gray, dark gray, dark gray, dark gray. It would make more sense to signal only the times when the intensity changes. And in fact, that's what retinal ganglion cells do. They measure the local or the, the current light intensity and subtract from that the light intensity a little bit in the past. In a condition like this, therefore, the ganglion cell remains silent. A little bit later, that particular spot turns bright because it moves across the edge of that column. And so for a brief period, the intensity is brighter than it was in the past, and the ganglion cell fires a burst of spikes. So here we see prediction and time operating. The principle is the same. The retina tries to predict what the intensity is going to be and subtracts that from the actual intensity. This kind of processing, again, has a strong effect on your visual perception. Parts of the scene that are static and don't change almost disappear from view, and only the parts that change are still visible. Let me show you an example. Here I'm going to have to ask you to hold your eyes still on that center cross. So fixate the cross and try to hold your eyes as still as possible. Ready? Okay, now some of you might see a green spot running around in a circle, and the pink spots may almost disappear. Raise your hand when you have that kind of uh, feeling. Okay, that's a pretty good fraction already. So you can take your eyes off the cross now and try to follow that green spot around. <laughs> All right, so there is no green spot, right? <laughs> there are only pink spots. And the pink spots are there all the time, or almost all the time, which is why they disappear from your view. Occasionally, a pink spot goes gray, and that's the only thing you perceive. And because the decrease of pinkness is like an increase in greenness, that uh, leads you to the perception of the green spot. How does the retina do this uh, operation in time? It's actually very similar to what we already discussed. A ganglion cell gets excited by bipolar cell and inhibited by amacrine cells. Now, some of these amacrine cells are connected very locally, in fact, connected to the same bipolar cell that gives the excitatory input. So let's see now what happens when the photoreceptor sees a change in light intensity. Well, that means the bipolar cell signal goes up suddenly. A short time later, the amacrine cell signal goes up. The delay is because it takes a little time from the bipolar to the amacrine cell to, for the transmission. And the ganglion cell takes the difference between the two, so its signal goes up and then down again, and it only fires a brief burst of spikes. So in this way, ganglion cells encode only when things change, not uh, when they remain constant. Now, in both these cases, uh, the prediction for the image was made by retinal amacrine cells. These are the inhibitory interneurons that try to keep the ganglion cells from firing and they come in an extreme diversity of types. We think there are about 30 different types of amacrine cells in the retina. Some are tiny, they only connect to one pixel effectively. Others are huge and send their processes clear across the eye. Here I've drawn them both on the same scale. And we think this is a hint that the retina performs much more complex computations than the ones that I've indicated for you now. In fact, we know quite a bit about this already, and uh, the sense is that there are about 20 different kinds of image processing that happen in your retina. We know this because there are 20 different kinds of retinal ganglion cell, and each population of ganglion cells covers the entire field of view. So each of those populations sends a different kind of feature about the visual image onto the brain. Now, these 20 channels of retinal output, of course, are just the very beginning of visual processing. If you look into the brain, they feed this fantastic hierarchy of visual areas in the cortex, in addition to circuits uh, elsewhere in the brain. And now, in this hierarchy, you've seen the slide already today, uh, each of the colored boxes is another circuit of neurons of complexity equal or greater than that of the retina. And our program, as a speaking as a community, is to crack each of these circuits, put the information about the computations that happened there into such a diagram, and from that, try to understand how the whole machine works. 
Now, this seems like a tall order, and I would say that most of us harbor the secret hope that uh, each of these boxes will end up being a variation on a common theme, that we won't have to sort out what happens in each of these circuits from scratch, but they'll actually follow some common principles. And if this is the case, then I think the understanding of these systems and circuits can fall into place much more rapidly. Finally, let me summarize briefly what uh, we've learned today. Uh, the first idea is that uh, relatively simple circuits can perform what seems like difficult computations, like predicting what's going to happen in time or predicting what will happen in a different part in space. And these predictions in the retina we've seen are made by the inhibitory interneurons. And they come in a huge variety, probably because there are so many different kinds of predictions going on. And it should be noted that much of the brain is actually involved in trying to predict the future for you and help you out that way. And this is possible that this is related to the general diversity of inhibitory interneurons. And finally, let me restate that the rules for the computations are stored in these plus and minus signs that I had in my circuits. So they are in the strengths of synapses that govern how signals are being combined. And much of that is stored in the circuit through evolution. In vision, for example, animals have dealt with the same physical world forever, and therefore those rules stay constant. They can be written in by evolution and genetics. Other rules, of course, are acquired by recent experience. Thank you very much.